Hello, sports racers, and welcome to the Global Paralyzing Anxiety Meditation Hour. Um, I'm going to continue yesterday's uh, question about resistance to change. Um, yesterday was more specifically resistance to change with respect to meditation itself. Um, and there, it, the question was paired with um, an, an open-ended question about resistance to change with respect to everything, presumably. Um, how can a person become more flexible and less resistant to change in every aspect of their lives? Um, it's worth going over the, the ground rules one more time, as usual. Um, this is not meditation instruction. I am not a meditation teacher, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is just a discussion about meditation at, at a high level um, from me to my friends and family. Uh, part of the reason for reiterating that caveat is because um, with respect to dealing with change, I uh, am going to specifically talk today about Vipassana as opposed to Anapana, um, which we've been discussing largely until now. Vipassana is at its essence, um, at its root, it is essentially this. It is essentially the practice of becoming better at dealing with change. Um, and it's worth exploring. Uh, we, in the context of this discussion, we can only do so intellectually, but it's worth exploring how it does that um, and, and why it's able to do that. Um, Anapana begins with this very narrow and simple exploration of the body. So your attention is here, um, below the nose, above the mouth, and you're exploring the body only in that one place. While you're meditating Anapana, you'll notice changes. Um, you'll notice changes in your breath to begin with is the kind of grossest, most obvious changes that there are. Perhaps even more gross than that would be changes in your mental state. So thoughts and emotions that keep surfacing and, and changing into something else. Um, these are all very obvious. But you'll also notice some other smaller changes. Um, so small sensation, uh, sensational differences, temperature differences in that small area where you're paying attention to the breath. You may also notice um, a, a subset of waves. So if you think of the breath as, you know, sort of one wave, right? Um, in breath, out breath. It, it's like any other kind of wave, um, whether it's a stock market graph or a graph of natural phenomena, there's always other waves within that wave, right? Um, smaller, subtler waves that maybe aren't obvious initially, and you'll become aware of those. So fluctuations in the breath that happen within the course of an individual breath, in breath, out breath. Um, there might be dozens of fluctuations or hundreds of fluctuations within the course of that one breath. Um, and uh, I spoke about this before, this idea that this experience is one of time sort of stretching out. So normally we think of one breath as not taking very long, but it is possible to pay close enough attention to that breath that the time it takes for the breath to occur to your perception um, seems much longer. 
I mean, in universal time, in like atomic clock time, it's the same amount of time, but your perception of time is changing. So one breath might feel like it's taking many minutes um, to you. And so you can see smaller and smaller pieces inside of the breath. This is a, a microcosm um, of Vipassana. So Vipassana is also working with, with large things to start with. And once we get a handle on those large things, um, we can start to say, oh, okay, how can I break this down? So if I, if I grab this large thing and now can I get it into two pieces, right? And then let's take one of those pieces and can I break that into two pieces? And then we'll take one of those pieces and can I break that into two pieces and so on and so forth. Not necessarily one piece into two pieces. Um, it breaks apart in irregular shapes at best. Um, but what you're doing with the breath is you're taking this this wave, right? Um, and you're breaking apart time, but there's no real physical component to it. There's, there's no space involved. Um, but you're noticing different changes, different changes, and you're becoming accustomed to those changes. So early in your med meditation practice, it's likely that if you, if naturally you stop breathing, or if naturally your breath becomes panicked, that you will respond to that. Um, and it's actually the response that you're trying to stop, right? Don't react, don't do anything, just watch the breath and see what happens. And part of what you're seeing is the reaction, but those reactions will slow over time. With Vipassana, you are still dealing with time, right? You're still breaking apart time and trying to find smaller pieces of time, but you're also trying to find smaller pieces of the physical world now, so space. Um, Vipassana is very simple. It's basically this activity of anapana and um, you use it as uh, a tool, um, anapana specifically, to move through the entire body and you basically do this this narrow activity that you're doing um, near the nose with the breath as an aid because the breath is very it's very easy um, when it comes down to it as far as sensation goes feeling the breath under the nose is very accessible um, so accessible in fact it can live in the conscious world so if you need to push a harder breath through your nose, if you need to hold your breath, if you need to take smaller breaths so that your mind doesn't wander, um, that's possible. Uh, and what isn't possible is for you to control sensation in that same sort of way in the conscious world um, during Vipassana. And so um, it's necessary to practice Anapana before Vipassana um, and a Vipassana course is 10 days long, but the first three days are, um, they are entirely Anapana. And the, the intention is precisely this. You need to get uh, some amount of practice in with conscious and unconscious um, maneuvering so that you can live entirely in the unconscious space. <clears throat> because Vipassana has no tool available um, for you to consciously draw your attention into a thing the way you can with the breath. And what you're trying, <clears throat> what you're trying to see in Vipassana is just this change. Um, so in Anapana, the change is your breath, in Vipassana, the change is any sensation anywhere in the body. And you will explore the entire body looking for these sensational changes. And initially, you'll just feel sensations of some sort. Or you might not feel any sensation at all. And then you have to very patiently wait for sensation to arise. Um, but even the arising of sensation is, is a change. That's a change from 
oh, I didn't feel anything before. Now I feel something. Um, and you'll know this with anapana as well. Initially, it might be very difficult to feel anything in anapana. But after some practice, after some practice, um, you'll start to feel all sorts of strange things um, in that area. Um, sensations that you don't nor normally maybe associate with breathing, day-to-day -day breathing. And Vipassana is again a sort of microcosm. So if Anapana is a microcosm for Vipassana, where you have more control over the conscious and unconscious sides, um, and where you're not concerned about space at all, you're only concerned about time in a singular space, time and investigating time and changes over time, then uh, Vipassana is a microcosm for change in the outside world. So um, at the grossest level, we can look at photographs of ourselves from one year to another year to another year, and we see ourselves changing. Um, if we need a more immediate example, we can take uh, stop motion photography of a rotting bowl of oranges um, or something like that. And we can see, oh, okay, the oranges, they look very static, but actually they're changing, they're changing. And this is, it's a useful starting point, but it's entirely intellectual and it has nothing to do with meditation particularly. It's just enough for you to accept this idea that, oh, okay, change is inherent in everything. And um, this is a kind of fundamental property that you can explore about yourself. And so the fact that you yourself are changing is what is interesting in the practice of Vipassana. And um, the, the other half of this, so one half is that you're, you're examining sensations in the body throughout the entire body, um, looking for change and within the body you're learning to deal with the outside world piece by piece a little bit um, the other half of this cannot be understood intellectually it has to be understood experientially that you really have to try it once at least um, and know that it is true that for every event in the mind, uh, a thought, an emotion, um, anything that emerges in the confines of the mind, there is an equal and, uh, I wouldn't say opposite, but there's an equivalent sensation in the body. And that um, it is my opinion, at least, that the, the exploration of the the mind can't be done directly, at least not by part-time amateur meditators, maybe by monks in the Himalayas. But um, for us, if we try to look at the objects of mind, we get bound up in the objects of mind. So we get obsessed with whatever it is we're looking at, or I'm looking at anger, or I'm looking at sadness, or I'm looking at depression, anxiety, obsessions, um, the objects of those emotions or thoughts become the meditation object itself. And that's not helpful um, because essentially you just become uh, subject to the same obsessions that you were previously. Um, and that's not meditation. That's just thinking really hard about something. Um, so you actually do not have access to your mind. There is no way to meditate on thoughts, um, maybe at very, very high stages of meditation. Um, once you've dissolved these thoughts into their component pieces, you can take a tiny piece that doesn't look anything like anger or it doesn't look anything like sadness. And you can say, oh, okay, this tiny piece of thought, let me examine it. Um, leave that to the monks. Um, as a normal human being, you don't have access to those things, but you do have access to this sort of strange back door, which is the sensation on the body. And this property that, that these things are mirror of one another is very interesting. Um, uh, as one Vipassana teacher, actually my first Vipassana teacher explained it to me, 
um, I was questioning him on this, like, why are we meditating on sensation? What is this all about? And his explanation was uh, fairly simple and very reasonable. Um, he said, you cannot handle the thoughts. You cannot handle the emotions. So you don't look at them. You can handle the body. So any amount of pleasurable sensation, any amount of painful sensation, physical sensation on the body, you can handle that. And if there comes a point where you can't handle that, um, the response is just to you change your posture where, where you're sitting down or you get up and you stand up and you walk away. And no matter what you were feeling physically inside, it will relatively quickly dissolve as soon as you walk up, stand up and walk away from your meditation. Um, and so th this is, uh, again, something that... Um, unlike the idea of um, the component parts uh, digging through time and slicing up time, um, uh, unlike understanding that intellectually, which is very possible, um, so I can say, oh, okay, a breath takes this shape and you can cut it in half and then you can cut it into quarters and then you can cut it into eighths. Um, anybody can understand that and anyone can accept it intellectually. Um, the idea that change in the body um, is reflective of change outside. Oh, my shoulder hurts. Oh, now it doesn't hurt. Oh, okay, there was a change. I guess everything is changing. Um, intellectually, you can understand that and intellectually you can accept that. Oh, okay, this seems fundamentally true. Maybe that's a valuable reason to meditate. This, the mirroring of thoughts and emotions on one hand and physical sensation on the other hand, there is no way you can accept this intellectually. There is no way that you can take my word for it. You fundamentally do have to try it. Um, there, are, uh, there are good examples, right? Physiological, extremely gross, high level physiological examples that we can think of. Um, I'm going for a job interview and I'm nervous and I feel sick, almost so sick that I want to vomit, right? This is not, this is not obvious biology. This is not a, a consequence of the external world. Um, entering into the office space of my potential employer does not make my body sick, right? This is my mind influencing my body in such a way that it's very obvious. Oh, okay, I'm nervous, that's an emotion and I'm physically ill, that's a physiological response. Um, when we were all first going through puberty, we all experienced some sort of, um, uh, some small crush on someone, um, some other boy or some other girl, and we would feel butterflies in our stomach, right? Again, a physical sickness sort of feeling. Um, and it's, it's really visceral. Like if you're 11 or 12 or 13, you really do want to barf, right? When you have this like, um, in hindsight, it seems a, or like small crush, love struck sort of feeling. But when you're that age, it feels really significant and it really influences your physiology. This is again, the, the mind and the body influencing each other, but in particular, the, the mind affecting the body quite directly. Um, anger is another good example, right? Um, many of us, I, I think only really know that same like butterflies in the stomach, visceral sensation of anger. Um, we can probably count on our fingers, the number of times that we've felt anger like that in our lives. Um, assuming we have at least a relatively normal relationship with anger, um, it is possible, and I've certainly felt, it is possible to be so angry at a person that it feels like there are hot knives digging into your chest and it makes it hard to breathe. And 
it's not quite like panic, but it's uh, it's a really intense physical sensation that feels like something is wrong with my body. And that's anger, right? That's anger at the physiological level, the grossest possible physiological level. Um, if you can notice it in a, the course of a normal day, this is, this is the maximum. This is as intense as it gets, is when you can feel it within the scope of your body as one individual. Um, that's very gross. And so the intention of Vipassana is the same as our, uh, sorry, as, as our breath, right? Cutting, cutting our breath into chunks, into halves, into quarters, into eighths. Um, we cut up the body into chunks. So first we start by separating, oh, okay, what is the sensation in the head from the sensation in my arm, from the sensation in this arm, the sensation in the torso, and so on and so forth. And then we start cutting that up. Okay, one side of the torso versus the other side of the torso. And what's interesting about Anapana is it gives you this microcosm of Vipassana in a good small space, right? Like one inch by one inch. And within that space, you can see, oh, okay, there's weird sensations, little bubbles and waves and uh, numbness and heat and all sorts of bizarre stuff is happening in there that um, if you change the location, right? Oh, okay, I put my attention on my left shoulder. I don't have that kind of distinct sensation there. I feel something, but I, I'm not that aware of this narrow space and I'm not slicing it up into further narrow spaces. Oh, okay, one inch by one inch, what's half an inch by half an inch by half an inch by half an inch. Um, and, and this is precisely what Vipassana does. And so you, you start, as you start digging through um, the physical, so if the physical starts with the whole body and then you're down to half a body and then you're down to quarters of a body, a head, half a head, just my face, just my chin, just this tiny spot under my nose, et cetera, et cetera. As you get to these smaller pieces on the physical side, you get to smaller and smaller pieces on the mental side. So you start to see smaller and smaller thoughts, smaller and smaller emotions, and you can start to appreciate where these come from. Oh, okay, why am I having this thought? Why am I angry? Why am I sad? From whence sadness? What? It's not that it just bursts into existence, right? Sadness is comprised of smaller bubbles of sadness uh, and other things, right? And behind that sadness, maybe you realize, oh, okay, actually it's fear. And it's these tiny bubbles of fear, but like where is the fear coming from and why? And the, the physical gives you access to that. So it gives you a, a doorway to... Um, to a material consciousness that you can get a handle on and you can say, oh, okay, like this is what this thing is, sadness. Okay, let me unpack that. Let me open it up and see what's inside. Um, and uh, so when it comes to the initial question, the question of um, dealing with change and um, being open and accepting to change, what it what is inside that question is okay there is change and i have responses i have reactions to change right someone in my family dies um i lose my job i have a fight with my spouse or my close friend and i i feel bad about these things right this is on the the bottom end of the spectrum, well, generally someone in your family dies, you feel bad about it. On the other end, right, you have all sorts of other emotions that um, you have joy, you have physical pleasure, intellectual pleasure, you've solved a problem, you have um, come up with a great idea, you've expressed your love for someone, um, these two have component parts. And so 
uh, it's important to appreciate that these two are also subject to change and that they are also your reactions to change and um, your interpretation of change and that all of all of these things they whether it's positive things seemingly positive things seemingly happy things or whether it's seemingly negative things um, seemingly destructive things uh, sadness and fear and everything else that all of these are our reactions to change in the outside world um, and that really when we say, oh, okay, how to deal with change, the question is how to deal with our reactions. Um, how can I calm my reactions down a little bit so I don't get so excited when I fall in love that um, if that person goes away, I will fundamentally break down and go into a depression. And then from one end of the spectrum to the other, I'm vacillating from extreme happiness to extreme unhappiness um, that instead it's not that we lose these emotions but that we're okay moving between them without getting so involved um, and this is how actually through the body um, I'm, I'm no expert I'm uh, an amateur meditator like the rest of us but um, this is fundamentally the principle behind this idea. Um, it's what makes it practical. It's not an abstract or philosophical concept. Um, you try it for 10 days, you see if it works for you. If it doesn't work, um, you've given, if, if you decide at the end of a 10 day Vipassana course, oh, okay, this isn't for me. I don't like this. Um, you've tried in my experience, the most serious meditation practice you can try. So, and by most serious, I do mean the most intense, maybe the most difficult in some ways, but from there you can go to other things. You can explore Zazen, you can explore Kundalini. Um, these are also practical meditation techniques that work on similar principles. Oh, the body and the mind, they're so interconnected. Why don't I dig through the body and then I'll dig through the mind together um, in, a, in a sensible way. Um, the, the value of, of a Vipassana course is that it's extremely consistent. It's extremely systematic. It is the exact same 10-day course for everybody, the world over. Um, the translations I hear are almost painfully precise, um, which means that the instructions in Japanese uh, sometimes take two hours where they would take one hour in English. Um, and, and, uh, and the courses are free and taught by volunteers who are authorized meditation teachers um, who see the value in the practice, the practical value in the practice, and they really want other people um, to experience that. So uh, that's, that's why I think it's a, it's a useful starting point. Um, and even toward the end of the course, um, the recorded instruction uh, says, like, look, if this isn't for you, this isn't for you. Like, find the meditation practice that is for you, that you find valuable, and dig deep on that and get results. Um, and uh, I think that that's a really practical approach. That's a really reasonable approach. Um, that it's not a, the end all be all by any stretch of the imagination, but it's about as systematic a meditation practice as you will ever find, um, whether you find you like that or not. Um, and uh, it is, a, a very practical and very rational tool for dealing with change and um, finding sometimes comfort in change where previously it would have caused us pain. Um, I realize that I've gone way over my time today. <laughs> so thank you for being patient with me. Um, if you have, uh, in fact, you know what? I don't have my timer with me, which is a mistake, bad planning. So today, uh, maybe uh, because I've talked for so long, uh, 
Um, everyone can go and meditate for 10 minutes on their own. Um, if anybody's been meditating with me, I don't know, but um, today you can do 10 minutes on your own, maybe even try 15 minutes uh, if you're feeling um, particularly excited about it. And we'll see you all tomorrow. All right. Good night.